So uh, hi everyone, thanks for joining. Um, on my end it's uh, uh, 7.15, I'm not sure where you are or from. But uh, it's great to be here. My name is Timo Terhoeven and I'm the founder and the CEO of Roots Bikes. Uh, we are a company from Amsterdam and um, as such we uh, really enjoy seeing pictures like this where bikes are slowly but surely taking over our streets. And, uh, that's a great thing. Uh, and lately, especially in the Netherlands, we've seen that e-bikes are playing a bigger and bigger role in that. So actually in uh, 2021, uh, it was the first year that more e-bikes were sold in the Netherlands than bikes. Um, and on the one side, that's, that's really great, of course, because uh, now it allows you as a rider to compete better with cars, um, to cover longer distances, uh, you know, on my cargo bike, I regularly take four kids to school, and that's that's great because we can leave the car behind. But there's also a downside to the story because e-bikes, you know, by design are more complex products than regular bikes. And hence, they need more maintenance and more repair, and actually also uh, repairs are more complex. And what we're seeing now in the market is that um, you know, local repair shops are really struggling with uh, the amount of work and also struggling to get uh, to find enough talent in uh, mechanics to be able to perform all these repairs. So as there is talent shortage and as this complexity goes up, uh, actually cost of repairs goes up and with the increasing cost of repair, the end of life of a bike is closer. So the average e-bike you know, gets a shorter and shorter lifespan. Um, where, my apologies for that, uh, where on a normal bike you might see lifespans of you know 20 to 30 years. I mean here in the Netherlands almost everybody has a, you know, a bike in their shed of 20 or 30 years old. Actually on e-bikes we don't see that. I mean they have not been around that long but still uh, on my routine to work, I rarely see an e-bike older than maybe you know, seven, six or seven years. So um, this is becoming a really big problem. And we're afraid that this will, uh, you know, e-bikes may become a major source of e-waste. Um, and we want to prevent e-bikes with their e-waste ending up in landfills such as this. So we think there's no time to waste and we should act now. And as Roots Bikes, we are uniquely positioned uh, to tackle this problem because uh, Roots, by design, is a circular company. And for the last decade, we've been designing circular designer bicycles, uh, such as the ones you see here on the left. And these are actually made of scrap from old bicycles that are you know, discarded in the Netherlands. Every year in the Netherlands, uh, we discard around 1 million bikes and we buy those uh, scrap bikes from local cities and remanufacture them into beautiful designer bikes. But also we work with uh, some of the largest bike fleets in Europe. Um, a well-known example is the, or the Dutch uh, public transport company that we've worked for since 2015, I think, and we've remanufactured thousands and thousands of their bikes into a even better than new quality and they ride around every day. So we are really experts in end of life bicycles. And you know, based on this knowledge, um, three years ago, we set out to develop an answer to this threatening uh, e-waste stream and to develop the first circular e-bike that will now come on onto the market. And we've called it Roots Life. So here we present our new e-bike. Um, and you've just taken a very different starting point than regular manufacturers. So where most manufacturers, you know, they optimize their e-bikes for production costs, lowest production costs, uh, lowest cost of the customer to buy the bike. We have gone for a different approach. We've developed this bike for uh, optimized for longevity and for total cost of ownership. And to do so, we put together a multidisciplinary team to you know, build this bike into a different structure, in a structure like no other. This bike is a completely modular design. As you can see here, and I hope this animation works uh, your end uh, as well as mine, 
Uh, as you can see here, this bike really is composed of a limited set of modules. And each of these modules can be swapped in minutes. Let me just run it again, if that works. Uh, so these modules can be uh, swapped in minutes, uh, which you know chops up the repair uh, from uh, swapping at a customer, swapping on the bike. And then uh, the actual repair of the, the module is done in our facility in Amsterdam, where we have all the knowledge, and all the uh, industrial processes at hand to do that most effectively. So this really reduces the repair cost. This modular structure also allows another thing. It allows to make a bike that is built to handle anything, a, a bike for life. So our customers are able to configure a bike and reconfigure a bike um, to their needs. And actually, it's, we're not only really building a bike, we're actually building a platform. So we're starting with this bike, but as you can see from the sketches in this anima little animation, we, are, we will actually extend this platform with a cargo bike, with a long tail version, and with a speed pedelec. And actually, for many of those functions, our modules are already prepared. Our motor is already prepared to run as a speed pedelec. Now, be, because we wanted to do this in a circular and socially responsible way, we also wanted to produce the bike as locally as possible. So this is a good example. This is our uh, stainless steel frame. Um, this is a pressed stainless steel frame that we can actually make here in the Netherlands at scale. Um, it's made in a very, uh, very nice local and flexible process, which also allows us to iterate on it a lot quicker. Um, also, we've, when it comes to the drivetrain, um, we really looked at the market and existing drive systems did not meet the requirements to make the modular setup that we wanted. So uh, we developed a, a powerful and now also patented uh, drive module, which actually combines the drive system and the shifting system in one unit. And by doing this, we actually put all the complexity of the, of the bike or most of the complexity of the e-bike into one unit, into one module, which again can be swapped in minutes, four bolts and a plug, and you've swapped out the entire mechanical drive side of the bike. Uh, and a big reason for doing so is that, um, you know, as we all know, the parts that takes take the biggest beating in the bike, the wheels, uh, that we can make those as simple as possible. So no more complex wheels with shifting hubs um, in the back and shifting servos attached, uh, braking cables, braking hydraulics, um, all, all that kind of stuff. We designed that all out. We, are separate, we separated that. We even separated the brakes from the wheel hub itself through a special uh, interface that we developed. So now, you know, replacing the rear wheel on a full-fledged e-bike with seven speeds and a nice, a powerful system, a drive system takes under 30 seconds. Uh, this is really amazing for, uh, for service needs, of course. Um, and because we design for like that longevity and because we care about our products and in many cases in our business model, we actually want to buy these products back from our customers. Uh, we want to monitor our bikes. So we've developed a sensory layer on the bike. Um, at several points in the bike, we measure things. Uh, a good example is uh, measuring vibration and temperature in the drive module to, uh, to detect anomalies. Um, and if we detect an anomaly, we see that, for example, that the temperature is getting too high, we see a certain vibration, we will flag this module for maintenance and inform the rider. And by doing so, we actually achieve two things. Um, the, you know, we, we, we fix the problem before it really breaks materials and destroys value and, and destroys precious resources. And we really reduce the chances of breaking down on the way. So you know, we create maximum uptime for, uh, for the user. And next to the, uh, the sensing in the motor, we also actively sensor, uh, uh, sense tire pressure and the brake performance to also guarantee you know, a very safe ride for our users. So 
What does this mean in the end if you, if you are one of our uh, live riders? It means that um, you know, if you get a flat tire, for example, we will know that you have a flat tire before you do. You, you'll know these little uh, punctures, you know, where you um, um, come home with a bike and everything's okay, but then in the morning you have a flat tire. Well, we don't have that anymore because you will get a message on your on your app on your phone that you have a flat tire and that we've already scheduled a module swap for this wheel for the next day. Because we've designed this bike so to be so simple uh, to swap parts, we, are, we can leverage existing uh, logistic networks, much like uh, package delivery uh, companies, um, to actually come by next week, next day, you know, open, open a box with a wheel in it, swap it, put the old wheel back in it, and the old wheel goes to, goes to our facility again. So you know, as a rider, this means you know, worry-free riding guaranteed and optimal uptime and lowest downtime possible. So I want to keep it short today to leave some uh, time for questions. I hope the system allows that. Uh, I just wanted to leave you with this. Um, the Roots Live Bike is now uh, available for pre-order at uh, www.roots.live. Check it out. Um, there's much more information on, on the website. And uh, keep monitoring that site because we will be adding a lot of uh, stuff soon. Um, and uh, in the Netherlands, um, test rides will be uh, done uh, next month, uh, as in the next months. So uh, please follow us. Thank you so much, James. Do you, do you um, have time for questions? Or are you uh, on your way out? No, 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 that's fine. Um, if you're, uh, I'll let you take it away. You guys can, this is your session, so you can take, be here as long as you need. Right. Great. Let's look in the chat here. Uh, there's a lot of information. All right, is there uh, audio from the, maybe someone in the moderation can help me how I actually answer these questions? Sure, sure. So, um, look through the chat. I can list a couple here. So. All right, so let's see here. Okay. How can we get companies like Roach Life partnering with government agencies to train next generation bike mechanics, designers, engineers, and transforming auto butter shops and working with trades colleagues and universities from uh, Janet Lowe? So how are we going to do that? Well, uh, Janet, that's a good question. We actually, we actually do that. Um, we have a social factory in Amsterdam. Um, we uh, had that since 2016, and next to our company, we've also set up a foundation which is aimed specifically at this. And the, um, we introduce about 120 people each year to the bicycle trade, and uh, around 30 uh, of those uh, people stick and really follow our training program. So we uh, we deliver uh, um, you know, uh, quite some some we introduce quite some people to the industry, and we deliver quite some mechanics to the industry as well. Um, so next question, can I repair puncture myself or any other to your repair from John Liddy? Uh, well, John, um, that is a possibility of the future. That's not what we're starting with, but it's definitely something that we're keeping in the back of our minds. Uh, in our first year, we really want to use, you know, um, logistic trained personnel. They're not fully mechanics, but we do want to use trained personnel to be absolutely sure that we do swaps uh, the right way. Um, there's a question about dredging pictures of barges, dredging canals from bikes, e-bikes. Yeah, the dredge, the dredge e-bikes. We get that question a lot. Uh, whether we use dredged up frames from the MCM canals for, for, our, uh, for our bikes. We don't. Usually those are really um, destroyed also by the barge itself. So. Uh, uh, we can't refurbish those e-bikes, but we need to, need to prevent that they actually get into the canal, uh, of course. Um, so how do you manage to deliver all those parts? Do you have a few sport cities or do you have some bigger partner? Now, indeed, we, uh, we are partnering with um, uh, logistic companies for that. So for 2023, we're really focused on the Netherlands. Uh, if everything goes well, end of the year, we'll also go to Belgium. Um, uh, that's really um, to make things reliable, but for that we already need a, a bigger partner. And the partners we use are typical partners that would 
also uh, deliver maybe your garden chair set and put it together for you, or maybe your laundry machine where they you know, move it up to your attic and, uh, and hook it up for you. We use the same partners for, uh, for our logistics and, uh, and, and uh, uh, swap service. This is an interesting one. Is uh, 2023 financially secure for you? Uh, yes, it is, thanks to our investors, luckily. Um, it's going to be a great year. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is a good question by Alexandre. Um, does modular design also consider the amount of waste it produce, produces? Yes, very much so. That's that's what it's all about. So you know, producing as locally as possible and you know, maintaining uh, a long lifespan for each of the modules is really important. And a very important tool that we use there, also from our experience, is that we can actually also upgrade, quite often upgrade uh, modules to incorporate a new trend or a new, uh, new feature. So even when a, a module becomes outdated, and I think uh, the bicycle industry is very much focused on you know, introducing these new innovations to outdate parts, we, uh, it's always going to be our goal to try to upgrade modules using existing materials much like we do with a lot of bikes actually we've done this um, for several bike sharing uh, partners upgrading their bikes to become better uh, better bikes and to be uh, used for a longer time uh, okay, some good information Let's see you. Marcel hey Marcel nice to see you uh, how's he, how easy is for a product like your bicycle to receive maintenance by users? Yes, yeah, same question. So it's relatively easy, but we we're not going to start it uh, in the first year yet. Uh, okay, and a question by Marcel: That repair service means you can expand only per region? Well, no, actually, it doesn't. And that's I think um, where we uh, where our setup uh, differentiates us from um, some other, let's say, bike sharing uh, companies. Um, quite a lot of, I think there are two main strategies in, in, in bike service uh, at consumers or at locations. Uh, one is to um, you know, rent a lot of vans, mobile workshop vans, and, and drive around and actually repair bikes at uh, people's houses. Uh, it's a very expensive uh, form because you need to find um, highly qualified mechanics, and then those highly qualified mechanics sit in traffic a lot of the time, so it's you know, not optimal. Uh, and the second approach is, you know, buy, uh, build local uh, facilities in, in each geography where you are, and the geography being a city or a region. We use neither of those. Uh, we use uh, a network of logistic providers um, to cover a whole geography. And actually, for us, it would be relatively simple to cover entire Europe because we would only have to train um, a limited number of people in those logistic companies who could then train the others and, uh, and, and do that. And it's all about, to fulfill that then, it's all about module stock, uh, you know, keeping stocks of modules locally to get us to a certain response time rather than doing a lot of repairs locally. Does this design consider a tricycle design for the elderly? Not yet, Alexander, but it's really nice. Um, we have actually, uh, someone has approached us about this. Um, so this it, it could in the future, um, uh, you know, life is longer than uh, than two wheels. Also goes to tricycles if you're maybe older. So uh, why not? Um, look to the challenge of tire recycling. Yes, we we have. We're talking to manufacturers about that. Are you building? All the parts in, in the Netherlands? No, not yet. Um, but we, uh, um, a, a lot of the parts actually come from Europe. Uh, also, for example, our even a drive module. Uh, you know, the cranks come from from uh, cranks that come from Portugal. The cast housing um, that the drive module is in uh, will actually come from a Dutch casting uh, company, uh, a casting company. So it's really cool. All the frame parts come from the Netherlands, but there are some parts uh, still from Asia. Um, but uh, a large, you know, the majority, far, by far the majority of the parts, does come from Europe um, and also uh, the Netherlands. 
Uh, all right, that's it for the questions, I think. So uh, thanks, guys, for uh, for checking in. I hope you uh, uh, catch some other sessions and uh, perhaps uh, speak soon at the Micromobility uh, Fair in the summer, where we'll be, and we'll also organize a nice uh, side event uh, since our factory is. You can actually see the factory from the micro mobility location at Komod Hall. So um, it's only uh, 100 meters. Come visit us and see you there.